Well, for this month's main feature, I've just driven pretty much all the way across the country as it goes. I'm very close to the Welsh border. Tady. <laughs> We're out in West Shropshire, and I'm here to catch up with a, a friend of mine who I've not seen for many years. He's what I'd class as probably the most innovative uh, anglers in the scene. A very interesting guy and he's a great storyteller as well. That is Frank Warwick. He's brought me here for a 48 hour session. So we're going to chew the fat, catch up on some stories. Um, I'm sure he's got a few new ones since I've seen him last. And obviously try and catch some very nice carp as well. But this place he's brought us to is an absolutely stunning lake. And by all accounts, it's got some pretty special fish in there. So Frank's down there getting set up. Let's go and catch up with him and see what his plan of attack is. What a place. Well, what a stunning place you brought us to, Frank. Yeah, it's mega, isn't it? It really is one of the, the jewels of Shropshire, really. A lot of people don't know it even exists, this place, unless they go on Google Earth. So, uh, out of sort of uh, courtesy to the other members, I'll keep it quiet where it is, but it's, uh, it's certainly fabulous. You say it's formed by a glacier? Yeah. Yeah, it's from the Ice Age, which a lot of the Shropshire Mears are and Cheshire Mears. It's probably about 12, 10,000 years, that sort of range, 10, 12,000 years. Because the, the ice over Shropshire was half a kilometre thick during the Ice Age. And uh, when it gradually, when the climate changed and it gradually dissolved and ebbed away, a glacier will have come across here in the first place and dug it down. And then as it receded, it's just left uh, what we call a kettle, which is where it scoured the bottom and down to the rock. I mean, if you if you look over there, the island in the middle, that's that's got hard rock underneath it, so it mustn't have been able to have wore that away. But this has got depths down to about 18 feet, 20 feet. If you look on that hill over there, there was uh, the guy, the Roman that was in charge of, uh, I think it was Shrewsbury and this surrounding area. He he had his villa up there. They, they've had an archaeological dig twice and found all the remains of his Roman villa. And this would have been his, his lake. You know, just think he might have actually have stocked it with carp in them days, because the Romans, contrary to what a lot of people believe, you know, you ask a lot of people, say, how did carp get into England? They say, oh, it's the monks. No, it wasn't the monks, it was the Romans. Because the Romans brought them over as a food source. And uh, when, when they, during the invasion, and they brought them across the channel in barrels full of wet leaves and brought carp in so they could drop them in every bit of fresh water to just create a food source. So basically, when the Romans went in the fourth century, they left a lot of these villas and stuff that they'd had, and a lot of them were taken over by monks, and they used to keep them as a food source. So that's where that rumour that the monks brought carp to the, to the UK came from, but it was the Romans that did it really. So this might have had carp in 2000 years ago, yeah. I'd probably not, but you never know. There you go, little history yeah. lesson. I should have bought my metal detector. Yeah, I've, I've got one as well. I was going to bring it, but I thought I better not, you know, because it's a private estate and I didn't fancy getting the gamekeeper pissed off. <laughs> so, uh, but I might do it one day, you know. They'd probably let me if they asked. I think I'll chuck the bivvy up in case it rains and then I'll uh, nip and get the boat in case we get a fish stuck in any, any pads or anything. And if we want to uh, use it for any kind of baiting up, you can use, you can use rowing boats on here to bait up, but you can't, you can't drop rigs, you've got to cast. They used to allow you to use these radio control boats if you wanted, but uh, 
they don't allow that anymore. So it's uh, it's good old casting now, which is good. I can have Frank, right, well, you've got a few bits out, but we're not, not quite set up yet. Um, yeah. You fished this place before a few times? Yeah, well, I, I've been here probably three or four years, and uh, I, I fish it very infrequently. Uh, a lot of people would be surprised at that, but I, I think it's so special. I just want it as a special occasion place. And uh, I've fished it maybe 10 times, maybe 10, 11 times. I've not kept account of it or anything. I just come when I'm, I feel that need to go somewhere special where you can just chill out and it's quiet. Uh, some beautiful fishing here. It's had a, it has had a not a problem in the past, unfortunately, because it's in a state lake and they can't fence it, no matter what the syndicate leaders wanted them to, but it's not been possible. Uh, so we've had to put up with that and they have lost some very, very big fish in the past. You know, nothing over 40, but some upper 30s. Uh, but having said that, there's fish that they thought have been lost and they've suddenly appeared after five years and you thought, well, that was long gone and then it's come out of 39 pound, and, you know, upper 30s uh, if you was to ask me out I, I mean I, I'm not anal about checking out what exactly is in here because I'm not a bounty hunter really you know I just go for the experience you know I'm at that stage of life where it's just nice to chill and know that there's some whackers in here and to me an upper third is a whacker no matter where you're from you know uh, mega fish as well so I I, prob I think I've had five different 30s out of here from those trips, which is great, you know, it's like 50% success rate, so that'll do me. And uh, I've had loads of nice 20s. Uh, the best I've had is seven in a 48 hour session, uh, in a red letter day, two years ago, this very week, so hopefully me and Joe will have a few like that. Uh, and I think, it's, I, I, I can't even imagine how many fish is in there. It's not a massive stock, but it's not small either. So it's, you know, uh, probably 15 to 20, 30 is in it, I guess. Max, I don't think there'd be any more than that. And uh, all to play for, mega surroundings. Funny thing about this lake is it never seems to get much weed in it. It's like it's been, it's almost like there's some super being fish keeper that's looking after it. And none of this Canadian pond weed grows or nothing. It's just the pads. Uh, you know, all, all the, the water quality is unbelievable, so we ain't got any weed problems. You can fish open water, you never get a stick of weed back, nothing. It's amazing. And the bottom, you get quite a good drop on it. Wow. So, considering it's like 12,000 years old, it's unbelievable, you know. Uh, amazing place. God knows how it sort of keeps so good, but it does. So, anyway, listen, Joe, we're going to, uh, we're mid, mid sort of way through getting set up and uh, let's crack on with that and then we'll show you some rigs and some of the other bits we're doing later and i'll show you how i've caught these fish on here uh, i know some of the guys who are in the syndicate that uh, i've met were quite curious because i've had a reasonable success rate you know uh, and so well, i'll lay it on a plate we'll have a look yeah well you've wet my whistle so yeah. um let's have a little yeah. closer yeah. look at the swims yeah, chose, yeah, shall yeah, we? yeah 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 sweet Nice one. You can see the wind's acting in our face here. This, this water I've found, uh, when it's becalmed and, you know, we've got a high pressure and there's no wind, it tends to fish very slow. I have had them like that, but when it's windy like this, it's hacking in. Although it's a bit tricky because of the position of fishing, your line can bellow around the uh, trees. It's wind in your face on it is absolutely essential if you're going to do it. So what I'm going to do now, I'm just uh, checking that I can, oh, I'm marking up before I clip up and then use the wrapping sticks. But I'm just uh, seeing how the bottom feels. I've got a five ounce lead on and uh, there are patches of silt. So I want to make sure that uh, it's not plugging in too much and then I would lengthen the hook lens or else use a helicopter style rig and switch. But I think it should be okay. It's fairly firm from my past 
sort of experience, but you never know, things are in a state of flux. Don't presume that the bottom's gonna be the same as it was the previous year, or the previous session even. But mostly, by the year, things can change. You can have a, a spot that was polished and quite hard one year, and then it can silt up again. So I'm just gonna check the bottom up against the pads, uh, clip up, and then I'll do it with each individual rod rather than uh, do you know, one rod and then do the rest for that because I'm going to be fishing the same area. Uh, so I'm not quite Elstow style where you've got three laser beams going out, but I'm going to fish that pad line and then, uh, yeah, see, see how it goes. Beautiful, fantastic, right on the edge of the pads. Nice drop, five feet deep, approximately. Good old donk when I got down, happy days. So I'll clip up with that one, so that's one sorted. I know it's bread and butter stuff this, but uh, for the newcomers and younger guys, when I was younger, actually, this is worth noting, uh, I got away for years because I'm a northern angler. We, didn't have, we weren't fishing the gravel bars with all the hard spots and all the rest of it. And we used to think that, oh, you could just blast it out and uh, leave it. If you try to get the maximum distance, you just let it go. You wouldn't feather it down and feel it down. We thought, oh, what's all that about? This was in the 80s and 90s. Obviously, I'm well traveled since and all the rest of it. And trust me, it was a mistake, even though I caught loads of fish doing it. Now, you know, I'll, I'll always take the time to really put the brakes on before, even if you're fishing for pads, put, put the brakes on, even if it means you're going to overcast and you think it's gonna, it's gonna hit the pads and put the brakes on, stop it in the air with the rod vertical, feel it down, then you don't get the bump, you know that you're in deep shit, length of the up length, or else try again, keep going until you find hard spots. Sometimes you can't find hard spots on places like this because you know, the silty maze, but there is always firmer places on most sort of lakes, especially of this nature if you root around, because even though it's silty, the fish do clear off spots. And that was a classic one, that, that went down with a massive thump there, so I'm dead chuffed with that. And it's probably in the uh, zone where I'm probably gonna get a bite. So, you know, you spend a lot of time sat behind the rods. You might as well spend an hour, two hours, getting it perfect. And a lot of guys think, well, aren't I gonna scare the fish? Well, it all depends on the length of your session. If you're fishing a, sort, you know, a short day session, different story, you might as well just wing it and think, well, I'll fish where the fish are and worry about getting the drop and where I'm fishing later. But when you've got a couple of days, we've got 48 hours, spend a bit of time and really, really, I suppose, examine the swim and investigate exactly what you're fishing on and then it'll pay dividends. Uh, if you're too paranoid about fish, fish come and go. They're moving, they've got fins, they, they come. If you might spook the odd one, but they soon come back to an area they want to be. And this is a classic holding area up against the pads. So they're going to come back or they're going to be traffic going up and down there passing. Now, the interesting thing with this lake that I've found, right, is I've fished open water, I've used chords, I've fished all the silt pockets, I've fished all different areas, and them rods were redundant. And you think, I'm fishing the pads. How do these fish just keep falling for the same old shit? You know, a trap on the end of the pads, surely they're gonna wise up to it. Well, they spend most of their life because there's food in the pads and snails and stuff, and it's a natural pathway. They just wanna be there. So there's no point in even worrying about it. The fact is they wanna be near them pads. So I was speaking to one of the regulars that's been on here years. I said, have you ever caught a fish in open water? He said, no. He said, no. I was like, I was amazed. He says, we've tried all sorts. We've had guys coming on doing massive baiting campaigns saying, well, I'm going to show you a catch them in open water. And they haven't caught any. So think on. Don't, you know, don't think being different's always the best. Sometimes you just got to go with it and think, right, they, they, they feed near the edge of the pads, so we're going to fish the edge of the pads. And that's where I've caught all my fish, so that's what we're going to do. OK, boys, there's nothing uh, too technical about this. It's just basics. I've got two mil pellet, 
micro pellet, three mil pellet. These are cart pellets from a company in Nottingham that I use, and uh, you can get them wherever you want, you know, screttings and whatever. Uh, I used to use a lot of the mainline uh, response pellets, they were brilliant. The Active 8 ones were sensational, but I can't get them anymore at the price I like to pay, Kev. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I've got two mil, three mil pellets. Plus, I've got eight mil pellets in there, so there's a bit of body in case the bits take away all the uh, the smaller stuff. I've got chop boilers. I use a Ridge Monkey uh, chopper, one of the best bits of kit I've ever used. It's not a blatant plug; it's just so useful. I've worn mine out basically. I've worn out two, so I chop the boilers. Do do about four kilo boilers chopped up, five kilo. If you can afford it, use less, of course. If you can't, uh, just do a smaller mix. And then I use some whole ones, not too many whole ones, because I don't want to feed them too much. I want them rooting for ages. And I always put sweet corn in the mix, unless I'm getting mithered with tench and nuisance species. Then I cut the corn down or I'll cut it out completely. So a couple of cans of that. And I put all the juice in, obviously, because that's one of the best bits. And uh, you may have used this, you may not. Uh, but I'm going to tell you, £2.50. Oyster sauce, one of the best things you can ever get. You can spend all this money on all these expensive gloves costing £10 for a little bottle and all the rest of it. Box to that, get this, it's fantastic. Chinese supermarket or even in Sainsbury's or Tesco's or anything, have a route around, £2.50. And then you can afford to get a bit liberal with it. So I absolutely plaster it. And it's got all the gear that you would like in, plenty of salt in there. It's got all the oyster extract. And I go pretty heavy on that, look at that. About three quarters of a bottle of that. Because it's £2.50, we can get a bit lavish with it. And uh, trust me, the cart love it. I've done tests with the bait and without it. And with it, it's a different ball game. The, you know, you want, it's like you walking past a, a chippy and the wind's blowing the opposite direction. You wouldn't be able to smell the fish and chips so it wouldn't go into your mind thinking, Oh, just fancy fish and chips. But if the wind's blowing your direction, you smell the chippy when you come out of the pub, you're thinking, wow, I could just do with fish and chips. Same thing. So we need a big liquid plume coming off the bait and that's going to do it along with some of the other bits and pieces. Uh, don't skimp on liquids. Whatever you do, liquids are, you know, people worry about overloading, but when you're using natural products like that and krill liquid and stuff like that and some of the hydroslates, you can't really overload it. It's when you're using synthetic flavoured sort of glugs that are, you know, blatantly pineapple, some cheap flavour that's been put in there with, uh, you know, some of the uh, syrups and things. It's pretty basic. I mean, they work, but stick to the natural stuff and you won't go far wrong, uh, in my experience. And then uh, there we go. So there's plenty of food signal billowing off that. Whether you're using your spawn mix or whatever you do with it, it doesn't matter, but that, that there is the business. Well, this is my swim just up from Fank. Um, I think we've named it Carlsberg, or maybe it's called that already. But yeah, as you can see, an absolutely stunning little corner. Loads of pads along this left-hand margin. Um, nice tree line on the back bank. So many different options of spots to um, fish to. A bit sport for choice, to be honest with you. The day has gone super fast. Um, like I said, I haven't seen Frank in quite a long time, so it's been really nice to catch up. But as a result of that, it's been, um, yeah, it's been hard to get any filming in, you know, so the, the day's getting on, but we've got a couple of days ahead of us, so yeah, like I say, it was, it was good to catch up with him. Um, he's got three rods out, he's all sorted for the night, he's got his bait out on top of that, which he put out in the boat. I personally, um, I've just tied up three rigs, just had a little flick around that far sort of corner there, and it all feels pretty nice around them pads, so I'm going to go out in the boat, grab the life jacket, um, scatter a little bit of bait around the area, might put a bit, bit further along as well, 
have a, an option to fish to, to tomorrow. But tonight I think I'm just going to spread free along that corner and uh, see how that goes. And like I say, prime that spot up ready for tomorrow. But yeah, light's starting to fade. Need to get some baits out of there. What a cracking place. <laughs> Well, that's it, three rods are out on the dance floor. Um, as I said, two at the back, and then one that did actually show just behind me about 25 yards out, and there was a little bit of bubbling there when we arrived. Um, and then on the way out to put a bit of bait out, put a couple of handfuls of uh, the mix over that. Not a lot at all, and then pff, only about half hour later, there was a bit of fizzing on it. So I had to chuck a rod on there, didn't I? Um, went down with a nice drop as well. So out of the three of them, that's the one I'm most confident on. Light is properly starting to fade now, so I reckon that'll be it for filming, unless we catch one this evening. Um, but failing that, hopefully, we'll have some good news for you in the morning. Well, unfortunately, it was a quiet night last night. Um, not seen anything show this morning either, but this is kind of prime time. So just um, sipping on a coffee and then gonna go and catch up with Frank, have a little chat with him, see how he's getting on. Um, but yeah, it wasn't much of a sunrise this morning and it looks like it's gonna be another gray old day. Um, we do a bit of rain as well, so we have to do what we can in between the rain showers. But there's a few little things that I'd like to talk to Frank about, a few little stories I'd like to get out of him. And um, like I mentioned before, you know, he's a very kind of innovative thinking angler um, who's always looking at, you know, the different kind of variables within his fishing and, you know, how he can catch more. Um, so, yeah, fascinating guy. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to be picking his brains for a few little gems later on today. Well, 10 minutes after getting round to see Frank, middle rod goes. What happened, Frank? Yeah, well, it was kind of bite time. And I half expected one to go and uh, walked up solid and it just cranked the rod round. Uh, a couple of bleeps and I charged over and picked the rod up and it had uh, clipped the pads, unfortunately. It was fishing very tight to the pads anyhow. Normally you can just get the head out and get them moving, but it, it was solid. Because uh, you went out in the boat, Joe, didn't you? And uh, tried to, to free it. And in the end, it slipped the hook, unfortunately. They're pretty good at doing that, aren't they, with snags and pads and things. Mm. It sort of gives them a point, I suppose, doesn't it? To yeah. To get yeah. that round. You've got to occasionally expect it to, you know, when you're fishing that close to pads like that. It's still a gutter though, you know. But you're always thinking, what have you just lost as well, aren't you? you know? So, anyway. Put a new rig on, because it had uh, blunted the hook. So, with your experience here in the past, is it mostly 
morning and night time. <coughs> but... night, night time or early morning. Well, any time up to 10 o'clock, but the first light till sort of 8 o'clock is the best time, definitely. I've had a few red letter days where they've just fed all through the day and they're quite rare. So it's uh, you're waiting for that little magical spell, you know. I've had quite a few at night. It's certainly October and November as the night's closing. You're more likely to get them at night, anyhow, on, on most waters. Uh, purely because there's more hours of darkness eventually, you know. So, uh, but you know what it's like in autumn, anyhow. A lot of waters just seem to switch on, don't they, at that time of the year. So, uh, your overnight is a better when you've got 12 overnights and things. But, uh, yeah. Well, pretty carpy our weather. I reckon we've got a chance today, haven't we? Oh, yeah. In the next 24 hours, we should get another bite or two. You know, I don't think it'll be more than that, being realistic, but... Uh, it sounds like the lake's been switched off a little bit. Mm, yeah, it's been fishing difficult, and certainly not a lot of the big fish have been out, which could be good news in one way, because you don't want to get there and find out that everything's been caught and it's fished its b****s off previous, and then you're there getting the dregs. I don't mind it when I've heard it's been fishing terrible. It means they're all due. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly that, yeah. I think it's, you know, it can only be in our favour to catch a decent fish. So we'll see. That's been a kneel on that. So I tried tipping that one with worm. Look at the state of what it's done. That's where I've got bleeps on it. When it's spun like that, you 100% know it's eels. It's absolutely spun and mangled it. Well, I've not managed to spend much time in the swim today because I've been busy next door with Frank, um, being entertained highly. Um, but I've just popped back to my swim about half an hour ago and one of the lines was out of the line clip on the rod, which is pretty strange. Normally, if that's happened, you've had an occurrence. Um, I didn't have a bleep for some reason. So anyway, I thought I'd better check that. That was absolutely fine. Um, so yeah, I don't think I had been done. Anyway, I was getting that one back out and the left hand rod has just torn into life. When I say torn into life, I'm fishing locked up, so there's only so much it can do, but I've got my buzzers turned up to a higher sensitivity as a result of that, because obviously when it's super locked up, there's not a huge amount of movement. So yeah, I've got them cranked up and managed to get on the rod pretty quickly. It only just got into the pads and thankfully managed to get it out and it kited out into open water. Um, then actually, it went under the jetty, <laughs> under my feet, and I actually had to hand line it out. So it was a little bit unorthodox, but we've got a fish in the net. So yeah, we're super happy about that. Just gonna get this rod back out. It did actually come on the one I mentioned about where I'd seen a fish yesterday, just on this left-hand side here, only sort of 25 yards up the, up the pad line where I'd seen a little bit of activity. And as always, you know, I have to let the fish tell me what to do. Playing the guessing game never seems to work. And if you just act on those little signs, then quite often, you know, you get the rewards. Right, let's get this rod back out there. I'll just quickly show you what I caught it on. It's a uh, 15 pound IQ combi rig with a little bit of supernatural there. A uh, little ring on the hook and a hook bead, obviously. And then a tiger nut and one of Ash's corns, the larger version. So it's not popping that up, it's just kind of balancing it if you like, just wanting to lift that hook a little bit off the bottom. And uh, yeah, that done the business. So let's get it back out there and I'll probably just stick another couple of handfuls on top of that because that's all that rod had on it. So um, yeah, maybe less is more in this scenario for this session. All right, chuff though. Let's uh, get this back out and we'll have a little look at him. It's not a big one, nice little common, but it's more than welcome. Well, hey, there we go. 
That's uh, my second ever Shropshire carp, but this one's much better than the other one because the other one was a, about three pound and, and an absolute mutant. <laughs> but this is a classic looking common. Um, like Frank said, you know, there's, there's some bigger ones in here, um, but they've had to put a few of these younger ones in for the future and to make up for the ones that the otters haven't eaten. But hopefully, some point in the next 24 hours or so, me and Frank are going to get to meet one of his older mates. Lovely job. Yeah, well done, buddy. Thanks, nice. Frank. Lovely to see. Yeah, thanks again for the invite, mate. Yeah, you're welcome, anytime. Cracking place. Right, I think it's burger o'clock. Starving. Yeah, <laughs> you've, you've been that busy, you've not a chance. <laughs> Right, so we've just had a 20, 25 minute rain shower. I've been sitting in my bivvy and I've just come around here and Frank has literally done this in that time. Frank, I'm absolutely blown away, mate. <laughs> it's another little hobby of mine. I, uh, I'm not good by any means, but I can, I can sort of uh, enjoy doing it, you know. People seem to like them, that's the main thing. I've got my own quite unique style, you know, it's quite bold and uh, loud colours. But it seems a it's a nice thing. And this is for you, Joe's a little present from me. Wow, mate, that is yeah. so uh, unbelievable, honestly. I cannot yeah. I would have thought something like that would take someone a day. <laughs> no. And you've just knocked it out whilst I've been up there making a cup of tea and a yeah. couple of rigs. The best bit is I I, I get a set of off eBay, I get sets of these uh, felt tips here from China and uh, they only last about two or three drawings well maybe more but they soon conk out and they're the cheapest chips and you get about 200 in the kit and uh, so I just use all the colours you know because I keep running out so I have to improvise and put other colours in but uh, yeah it's nice I'm glad you like it okay Frank I'm sure a lot of um, people out there probably think that you've been you know involved in the carp fishing industry a lot of your life but um, yeah. I know you've had quite a colourful and interesting life <laughs> over the years and you've had some interesting jobs as well do you want to just sort of run us through a few you know the interesting ones or, or we'll go back to you know from school if you like and yeah well I went to uh, I went to an art school because I was always okay at drawing and it but it turned comprehensive the year after I went and it was right in Cheetah Mill in Manchester which is one of the rough places and I had to get catch uh, I had to walk a mile to the bus stop because I live out in the countryside a bit catch two buses or else get a train and then two buses depending which way you want it so I had to set off two hours earlier to go to school so I hated it so I had the worst attendance record in the school's history I had 98 days off one year I used to forge my mum's signature and do sick notes and all that and they said you know they, I think they thought I was terminally ill I had that much time off and I used to go fishing you know, I was, a, I was a gang member as well. We had a big gang and that, you know, we used to get up to mischief and that. I wasn't no no angel. And uh, yeah, we, we, we were doing all sorts, it was, it was crazy. Anyway, uh, I missed some of the exams for my O-levels and things. So I never got any marks, but I got really high marks in English. So it was quite academic when I put my mind to it, but I was too interested in fishing and other things. And uh, chasing birds and all the rest of it like you do. And uh, then I left school and uh, struggled to get a job. And my dad says, why don't you join the Royal Navy? Like I did, because he was in it for 14 years. So I thought, I don't really fancy that, but I'll sod it, I'll go down. So I passed the test. They got three of us and I thought I was one of the failures. So they says, right, you three over there, you lot, there's about 40 guys in the room, letter for your doctor, letter for your doctor. And I thought, Oh no, they've all passed and there's three of us that have failed. I'm a demic. They felt your balls, did a medical, did everything like that, you know. General knowledge test and maths test and everything. Anyway, they got me and they says, you've got one of the highest marks. They says, uh, y y you're looking brilliant. But we we'd like to suggest that you're an electrical mechanic in the fleet air arm. So they had it all planned for me. I had to go down to the training college down in Devon. And they says, we're going to spend a lot of money on you. So they says, how long would you like to join for? I says, the minimum six years. So I says, six years. They went, oh, no, 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 no. We're going to be spending about a million and a half pound on you through your career, training you to, to dismantle helicopter engines and all that and be a top engineer, electrical mechanic. 
So he says, you, I, think I try to remember the date, he says, you're having 18, 25 or 30 years. And I'm 17 at the time thinking, oh shit, that's my life gone. So I said, oh, I'll have 18 years, stuff it. So I thought, oh no, I'll be ancient when I come out. I'll be, I'll be like, you know, just past it. I was panicking a bit, so they give me a date to go down to, uh, and, uh, to do it. And in the meantime, I met, I met a stunning blonde. We got all loved up and all that, and I thought, I can't leave her, you know. We just started getting cosy, if you know what I mean, and uh, things were happening, and I thought, I'm not leaving this. So I sent them a letter saying, can I get out of it? And I thought I was knackered, I thought I'd have to go. So they got an officer sent me, a, you know, a lieutenant or something sent me a, a shittogram say never waste their time ever again and never apply for the Royal Navy for as long as they live and all the rest of it. So then, uh, oh, there's so many jobs in it. I had to go as a postman and uh, I was, by that time I'd got motorbikes and that and I was banned from, from driving and riding bikes. So I had to get a push bike and cycle eight miles, get up at the crack of dawn, cycle eight miles to this bloody uh, post office. They give me an old shit bike that weighed a ton with a big basket on the front, loaded it up with parcels and it was all bowed and it was up and down all hills. And I was already knackered from the, the push bike ride because you know, when you don't ride bikes, you're not used to it. So they had me to go and taking tons of parcels and letters and everything. I thought, oh Jesus Christ, I was, I was shagged out when I got home. You know, could I, I couldn't sit down on the saddle, let's put it that way, blisters on my ass. So I said to my mum and dad, I'm not going again. That's it, finished. And then I got a job, uh, Stockport Council, as a bricklayer. I did that for a while. Then I got a job uh, on a tarmacking gang with all these navvies. And uh, that was unbelievable, that, you know. Uh, give you an example, there was one of these paddies. He kept a great big metal skillet frying pan under the, under the porter cabin. I'd get in in the morning, there was rats, footprints in it and rat shit in it in the lard where he'd been having to fry up. I says, mate, it's had a rat in it, that is rat shit in it. Oh, don't be a fucking pussy. So he'd get it on, he'd get it on the big burner, the big gas burner, melt all the fat in it and just chuck it away and then get, start cracking his eggs and put the bacon in. And I'm like, oh. And the same guy was unblocking main sewers with his bare hands and then eating his sandwiches without washing his hands and all sorts, human shit, you know. So I, I really wasn't mad on that job. And then, uh, I got a job making concrete posts in this place with these vibrating moulds and they weighed 160 pound each. So you're shoveling concrete into the moulds with big metal rods inside and it's vibrating, shaking it. You felt like your brain was coming out. You're working like a maniac. All day for eight hours a day, just shoveling concrete and lifting these. They're 160 pound, never mind the metal moulds on top. They weighed about 250 pound. And we're manhandling them to it. Oh, pfft. you know, I wanted to die but we needed money, you know. And then uh, I was out of work for a bit and I met this, I went fishing on Cape Sorn Hall and uh, I met this guy that was a bit of a noddy and he was sat on a metal matchbox and uh, he was pissing everyone off. He was a big bloke, a big galoot like a bear. And if anyone got a fish, he'd just spin round on his metal box facing their swim and blast across Cape Sorn into their swim put a rig in right in their spot. So they were all chunnering and going mad about him, but none of them dare confront him because he was a big old boy. So I says, I'll, I'll, I'll go over and see this guy. And he was sat on his box as a mate. I says, you're pissing everyone off. I says, you've got no etiquette or anything. I says, you're new to this, aren't you? He says, yeah, I'm desperate to catch a carp. He said, I've never caught one, he says. And obviously if there's fish in their spots and that, he says, I just thought I'd, I'd get near. I says, no, you can't do that, mate. You know, I said, you can't. anyway, we became friends and I taught him how to uh, fish properly and he got the gear together and he was fantastic actually. It turned out his name was Paul Nichols and he, he owned a massive advertising agency called Quick Brown Fox. And they had one in uh, Manchester and one in Chelsea in London. And he was a multi-millionaire, this guy, I didn't know it. He had Ferraris and everything and he says, mate, I think, I think the world you. He says, you're fantastic. He says, what are you doing? I says, I'm out of work. He says, I'm going to get you an interview at my place. He says, but you've got to do it on merit because he says, I don't pull rank on my, my uh, managers. So I went down and showed him some of the drawings I'd done in that. So I got a job there working in the dark rooms and 
as a finished artist. And I worked there for quite a few years and you know, me and Nichols used to go all over the place fishing uh, Duncan Kay's Mid North Ants. And uh, then I got a job working for Duncan Kay because me and Duncan became friends. So I went working in his bait factory and that was, that was carnage because Duncan was a lunatic. He liked uh, starting the morning with a bottle of Jamison's whiskey, which is where I think I got my love of whiskey from because we used to have half a pint pot and get the whiskies out for breakfast and then go to it. We, he used to drive us to work because I lived at his house. And uh, he was funny, Duncan. He had, a, he had a daughter called Clarissa, named after Dick Walker's record carp. And his son was called Finn. <laughs> so uh, he used to let his seven-year-old son drive his car. Can you believe that? We were fishing one day on Mid-North Ants, me and Paul. And we see this Volvo Estate come careering through the cornfield. We thought, shit, what's going on there? And it crashed straight into the lake. And we hear all this commotion and the, the seven-year-old was driving the car. He'd lost control of it and drove into the lake. And the, the car was... Like the, the boot was up in the air and the engine was weighing it down. Seven feet of water. You had to get a tractor to pull it out. All oil in the water and everything. Just mad. Anyway, uh, so I did that. And then uh, I worked at Manchester Airport as a trainee uh, aircraft mechanic, uh, which, which had massive prospects. I was going to work for British Airways. And I got offered a job as a, a ranger for much less money at Tatton Park. And I'd always fancied them lakes there. We since know that they've done fifties and that. But I knew, and I thought, if I get a job as a ranger, I'll be able to fish because there was no night fishing. And they said, oh yeah, you can night fish. So I thought, brilliant. And they've got all waters that the public don't get to see. And I asked the, the rangers and they said, yeah, there's carp in all of them. So I thought, brilliant, I can night fish. As soon as the public come, pack up, get to work. And then uh, this Commander Greystoke, it was like being in the military. He used to have you stood to attention in your army jerseys and all your combat trousers in the morning, do a uniform inspection, because he was a commander in the army. And he, he used to complain if your hair wasn't short enough and all this. You know, and then he says, right, he says, Warwick, your new job, car park attendant. I thought, oh, this ain't happening parking cars all day you know what I mean I thought no so I binned that off out of work for a while again then I got another job on a building site it, when it ever it got to the 16th of June or near the 16th of June the start of the old fishing season I used to get like all these palpitations thing I need to get sacked immediately so I can go fishing so when I was on the building site I went in the pub and just stayed in there went for my dinner hour and never came out so the foreman and all the guys come to back to work and I said no I'm not going so I got sacked on the spot then I was fishing all summer you know and I used to do it regular uh, but I, this is just tip of the iceberg I've done so many jobs you know and uh, yeah uh, then I worked in advertising again worked for some of the biggest companies in in, in, in the world was it Boddington yeah, I, I did the Bollington's Brewery uh, logo with the, with, the, with the hops and the bees. And uh, so I worked on that project and, you know, visualised a lot of it uh, for J. Walter Thompson's, which is a big American-owned company. I worked for Technique uh, Northwest and they, they had loads of branches. And uh, What's the best job you've ever had? What's your most favourite job? Uh, porn star. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. We had a joke about that. It seems to have stuck over the years. Uh, I had a wind up actually. There was, uh, and it seems to have stuck, and loads of people believed it because I had a moustache when I was younger. They all used to say, "Oh, what well, it looks like an old German porn star, you know? Das is good, yeah," and all that. So we were, I was always joking. So there were some people said, uh, "Frank, can I ask you a question?" I said, "Yeah." They said. You didn't do porn films, did you? So I was dying to laugh, so I said, yeah, I did a bit. I said, when I was at college, I got a bit skint and that, you know. I said, so, yeah, I did a bit. I said, only occasionally, you know. I said, the Monday morning, quite often, I'd be on the train going to work. You'd have all these miserable faces with all the punters doing the miserable shit jobs and that. And I says, and I'd be headed in there with two Czech goddesses that I was going to sort out, you know, and get paid for it. I said, so I had a big beaming smile. So they believed it, didn't they? So next thing, everyone's like, he's done porn films. So next thing, 
it was one of the most Google things, Frank Warwick porn films. <laughs> you know, you look at trends. So I pissed myself laughing and thinking they actually believe that, you know. Uh, they were trying to check you out. <laughs> yeah, they wanted to see some of the stuff like, you know. So, uh, yeah, I said, oh, it's all underground, you know. So, uh, yeah, I've had some laughs. But I've got, you know, I love having a laugh with people. So, uh, I mean, I, I told my missus, I says, hey, they all think I've done that. She says, you didn't, did you? <laughs> <laughs> she probably knew. <laughs> she probably had a bit of doubt in her mind. <laughs> so it was great, you know. And then, uh, I mean, I've worked for a lot of the big fishing companies. <clears throat> you know, Corder, and I uh, worked for Fox for a while. Uh, Gardner, uh, Century, Dynamite. Uh, oh, just loads of them. How about these days then, Frank? Who, who are you actually associated with? Well, I'm with uh, Sonic. I've been with Enterprise since they first started. Only a little company, but, you know, they're a nice, nice little close-knit group. And, um, well, yeah. stuff that you use as well with a lot of faith, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, uh, I've always supported them, you know, and it's just nice, and they support me, and we're friends, and... Uh, you know, I'm, uh, Sonic are lovely as well to work for. You know, they, they've, they've grown massive actually since I've been with them. And the bait company now? It's Vital Baits, which, uh, which caused a bit of a stir. Uh, I did laugh at some of the comments. They said, isn't he good enough to get any sponsorship from an English company? And I thought, if only you really knew. Because a, a lot of people just believe that only the English can make bait for carp. They think that everyone else is inferior. And I know why, because you see a lot of these cheap baits that were cheap Euro baits, you know, that were like wax or like bloody, you know, ball bearings and like, you know, you couldn't crush them even with a vice with all cheap rubbish in and that. But there are companies out there that really do some fantastic bait. Uh, and it would, it's almost like saying the English are best at football or the best at everything, you know. We are very good and we, we, we did start a lot of this, but where Vital uh, is based in Spain, they're the biggest bait company in Spain. And uh, Nicky Hedin is a Scandinavian, he's Danish with his wife, Marlena. And I heard about some of the baits that they were doing from the guys fishing Rainbow. They had some baits that were uber successful on the big fish circuit waters. So I got to meet Nicky through Henrik Hansen, who's another very good friend of mine from, he's Danish, but he lives in Norway, marries a Norwegian uh, lady. Henrik's mad on bait, so we had a common passion between us. And he says, oh, you've got to meet Nicky Heddy. He, he does his own thing. He doesn't conform to normal sort of recipes and this, that and the other. And he's a one man band and he's got some amazing baits. So I said, oh, okay. So we met and I liked everything he had to say. So I actually flew to the factory in, in Spain and I uh, was shocked actually, because to do the production he was doing, when I had a bait company, we had 11 people working there. And he's a Trojan, him and his wife, they're just doing everything. And I says, Nicky, why haven't you got a load of staff? Because he works crazy hours. And he said, uh, I don't want them knowing all what I use and what's in everything. He said, it's as simple as that. So I looked, he's got a relative that uh, owns one of the biggest fish plants in the whole of Denmark. So they get all the finest krills, all the best low temperature fish meals. They get the krill liquids. So, you know, and he gets at a preferential rate because it's a family rate. And uh, so he can afford to use plenty of what you need in there. And I thought, wow, the opportunities are amazing here. And we liked each other. So we decided to work uh, together. And that's working brilliant, you know. He let me make my own bait, which is one called the Mojo, which I've had probably the best winter I've ever had by a mile. Uh, so far this year, just in Cheshire, I've had 1930s and 340s. So what's not to like about that? You know, that's unheard of in Cheshire. I'm in a good water, mind, but you still got to catch them. So uh, that's fabulous. And we're only part way through the year yet. All the best times coming, so, you know, it's going to be good. And it's got a cult following the bait. The main problem is it's difficult to get continental bait to England, the same as like mainline and the big players in England are struggling to get their bait to, to Europe because of all the, now we've left Europe, there's all this legislation and it's a nightmare, you know, so it's affected a lot of people. 
and no one wants it the europeans don't want it and we don't want it but you know it's just politics really and uh, so it's a shame but we've worked around that now and we're working so that it can be manufactured under license in the uk uh, just for the guys that were using it on a field testing sort of uh, you know team member so they're at least catered for so uh, quite a subtle smell yeah it's quite subtle yeah mm. yeah but lots yeah. of uh, yeah, it's quite a complex bait isn't yeah it? it's quite a complex bait i mean everybody comes out with that sort of thing but it is it's got some unusual ingredients and i'll not go into detail but it's uh, stuff that I always wanted to, to mess around with in a bait. And uh, I wasn't sure of some of the things, to be honest. And then when we started testing it in a testing stage, it was uh, right from the word go. It was, it was quite outstanding, really. Some of the guys in uh, Belgium and uh, in Italy and Germany and that, some of the catches on it has been ridiculous. And it makes you dead proud, you know, you've got something where they're actually really ranting and going mad about it. I'm not doing a big sell here, by the way, because you will struggle to get it in the UK. So I can just say it. And in one way, I'm quite relieved in, in a bizarre way because it's selling like hell in Europe. So I've got an exclusive thing nobody can get. So uh, what's not to like about that, you know? So it's pretty good. Well, that was uh, another very entertaining evening. Um, the stories Frank's got are just incredible, really. Um, everyone needs to hear them. So, Frank, when you watch this, please do me a favour and write another book about some of your other stories. Um, for those of you who've not read Frank's book, I can highly recommend that. Some great fishing stories in there and also um, some of his thoughts about fishing, the things he's tried, tactics, baits, rigs, all of that malarkey. Um, I guarantee that you will feel, you know, like a, a more knowledgeable angler after reading that book, um, as well as being highly entertained. Right, I'm going to sign off for the night. Hopefully we're going to wake up to uh, a carp in the morning. But failing that, even if no more fish come from this session, then uh, I'll leave here, um, yeah, super happy that I came and, uh, yeah, with lots of stories to remember. Awesome. Bon way. Oh mate, it was a lovely start to the morning, wasn't it? Yeah, it was after all that rain yesterday and everything. It's a beautiful morning. Lovely bit of sunshine, those yeah. gorgeous reflections off the lake, and yeah, it makes you um, happy to be an angler them sort of mornings. Yeah. I would yeah. have been happier if there was a, a big chunk, but we've still got time yet. We've got time, but we're at the feeding time right now, really. You know, as I said, it's first light till about 10-ish is the best time. But well, you, had, you had yours yesterday in the afternoon, though, didn't you? So you never know. Yeah. Well, we've got baits in the water, but it still, it still pissed me off a bit that it's not fished I would have hoped, you know. That's fishing at the end of the day, mate, isn't it? Yeah, we say that, really but I've, I've, been on, I've been on a bloody roll, you know. I've been really having a most amazing year. I couldn't put a foot wrong, so I've probably cursed myself sort of doing this, you know. When we got here, the, the guys said, didn't they, it's not been fishing well? No, it's been doing a lot of small fish as well, the stockies, if anything, you know, so it's... Uh... And one thing, I, you know, you kind of notice from all your fish is that it's, it's quite clear to see, isn't it, when lakes aren't really switched on. I mean, there's yeah. been hardly any signs of feeding. Um, there's been hardly any shows. Um, I think, you know, we talked about it already, but, you know, you can see just how huge those sets of pads are mm. in here. And like you say, they're full of food. Um, full of snails and that, there, yeah. Yeah, the, and the, also the lake gets visited by otters, so that's a safe haven for them, isn't it? Yeah, I found that. It's uncanny. I mean, you, you just... Re I've never caught fish in open water. It's as simple as that. And you think, how do they keep falling for the same old trick, fishing up against the pads? Well, what it is, it's like it's a totally safe zone. 
and now you know, obviously they need to feed so it must be so tempting for them to think Do you know what i'm just going to chance it and get out there and have it and they keep just falling for the same thing uh so but that's the reason why they want to be right near the sanctuary you know and uh i mean the bites we've had have come you know, really tight to the pads and uh you might as well just forget it. The only time you'll catch them in open water is in the winter, when they'll migrate into the deeper water and stuff. You know, so harvesting those areas. Yeah, bloodworm and stuff, and you know, and there's the probably fly axes going on in the winter still. Uh, but they, they tend to be in the deeper water then, where the, the temperature is more stable. Certainly up to Christmas. Then after Christmas it changes a bit. They start coming back near the remnants of the pads and things. You know. Well, one thing I wanted to chat to you about, Frank, is obviously, you know, when you started fishing, there was very little information, very little tackle, and, you know, you've, you're very much so uh, of a thinking and innovative angler, you know, you're, yeah. you're always looking to see how you can improve your results mm. um, and, and trying lots of different things, experimenting, and it almost seems like a lot of that is lost in this modern age, isn't it? You know, like 90% of anglers seem to just do what's what they've read in the magazines or what they've seen on, mm. on the TV shows and that. And they're not really putting as much thought in as they could be to, to learn and understand things more. Would yeah, you agree well, with that? Yeah, of course. I mean, the thing is, you, you, the modern anglers just, just do what's what the norm. You know, that's when I was a younger bloke, we didn't have all YouTube and everything to see. You know, everything wasn't available. The, you, the tackle shots were quite rudimentary, so you didn't have a lot of the stuff. Even buzzers were like, you know, really rubbish. The ones that you could get the bite alarms and that. And, uh, you know, we, we just didn't have the gear. We didn't have a nooking mats in the early days. You know, you used to just rest them on wet grass and stuff like that, you know. So a lot of us used to use baby changing mats and cover them with something because they look ridiculous in white and pink and stuff like that, you know. So we'd just get some of the, uh, so like nylon material and make our own covers for them and things and uh, you know it just wasn't the gear it's, it's a different world so the same with bait and everything we had to we had to the only way of finding out was to try it so you didn't just go someone would go you know oh you know get on this boil or that boil. We we're making our own there was no mixes out there that were you know the early Duncan Kay and Rod Hutchinson really were the people doing the you know, and Jerry Savage, he did this thing called High Pro that was basically just trout pellet with a few other additives in PYM and stuff. Uh, but you couldn't, you know, you just couldn't get anything like that. So we we used to raid the kitchen, you know, and use all kitchen ingredients. So you found out by small additions, you know, using curry paste or chilli powder in, in your paste baits, you'd get a lot more action when you're adding these things. So we knew that that's what the fish wanted. So it was quite quick to show a result. Or if you use something they didn't want, that was quick as well. You just wouldn't get any twitches or any activity on the on the on the on the rods. You know, they weren't taking the rigs on. Because we used to obviously bury a hook in a ball of paste. So they thought, all oh, right, they were sucking and blowing it. And it gradually, you know, naively, they'd, they'd whittle it away till the hook was exposed, hook themselves, and that would be your bite. So when they were picking it up we used to have to see the line switch and strike actually fishing and striking you know now we've got self-hooking devices and the rods are doing their own thing you know you you're rod minded once you've done your thing expecting your rigs to do it all for you so we didn't have any of that so you know when there's so many baits out there that we used to try you know we used to use a lot of particles uh, which obviously because of the side hooking aspects of it we weren't burying the hook in paste, so you get peanuts or, uh, you know, kidney beans, for example. I caught tons on kidney beans and butter beans. So you'd have the hook. The only way you could do it was the hook was partly exposed, so they would be quite successful. But how many, how many of the people watching this will use butter beans as a bait or uh, kidney beans? With that in mind, we all know because it's been proven time and time over, you know, over the years, is that. You have super effective things, mm. um, but then they get forgotten about. Exactly uh, that, yeah. And then, you know, people are not trying them, but suddenly if you were to try those things, they're going to be a massive edge for you again. Uh, just well, you off say, the top of your head. You, like, you say a, a massive edge, Joe. You say a massive edge, but the, it can be, but 
people don't seem to have the patience or the, uh, the drive to try these things properly. They're almost scared to try it, thinking, oh, that, that's old crap, that, that won't work, or that won't, well, how do you know till you do it? But the key to it was, we, we used to persevere and actually introduce them and bait up with them and all that, you know, and it might take a, some things were quite instant, like peanuts, but other things were slower. But they, they inevitably worked, it was just a matter of degrees. Some things took, the fish were like, oh, you know, what's this? But other things, for some strange reason, they just take them straight away. You know, even things that they'd never seen before. That was like instant, that was medium, and that would be non-starter. So until you tried it, you, you couldn't possibly know. You mentioned peanuts there. Um, it's got to be one of the most underused and underrated baits on the planet, hasn't it? Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's one of the most amazing winter baits I've ever used, for sure. Really? Oh, yeah. Uh, we. I went on one place, uh, I talked about it in the past, the, uh, we went on a runs water, you know, with a big head of fish, it was a decent winter water, and we, we, we'd never, they'd never been used in there ever, I know they hadn't. This was the early 80s, so me and my mate went on there and we were spraying it with a catapult, putting the peanuts in, it was like really cold, it had cat ice in the margins, and I think they went mental, the fish, we couldn't keep the rods in the water. He was using two peanuts on the, uh, on the rig, basic hair rigs, you know, one and a half ounce sled, runs galore. We, we, we thought, what the hell have we found here? And uh, we were using a lot of peanuts, we constantly spraying it like a match angler. And uh, the guys were using boilies on the other side of the lake, just across from us, and they were hardly getting any fish. We thought, wow, what? other places where we took it that were more difficult, the bigger fish waters, you know, because there's less fish, you didn't see that instantly, they still wanted to eat them, there's no, no two ways about that. Fish aren't universally different, you know, they've got the same physiology and that from one water to the next. I know they're in their own little universe, but the reason why they weren't as quick on the big fish waters is because there was less fish. But when we actually introduced them over a period of time and the, uh, you know, if we could have located the fish instantly, I reckon we'd have caught them instantly, but we thought we had to pre-bait to get the fish on them, but of course, we'd already proven that they were instant. So you've got to get your mindset in thinking, peanuts work from the off. That's it. So I'm telling you that, but you need to find it out yourself to get the confidence to use them regular. So what I'd suggest is if you've never used peanuts before, go on the runs water to get comfy with them, and then you know they're instant and they work and then go on the more difficult venues with your peanuts and you go right they work fish like them it's the business and that's how we built up the confidence to go on more difficult waters you know and i think that's you know that's a key aspect for every kind of method isn't it you know if you're fishing a super hard lake and you've only honed a couple of different methods you know yeah. different, different rigs or styles of angling mm then you're not going to be very adaptable. You're not going to have the confidence to try these out of the box things. Exactly, yeah, because you've got no experience of it and you, you've got that doubt in your mind because it's not all on the plate. No one's done a video on YouTube that shows you that peanuts work on all these big fish venues and easier places, right? No one does it. Yeah, I remember uh, uh, I seen a, a, a video on YouTube. I mean, I'm like everyone else, I watch quite a few of them. I'm always interested to see if there's anything. I think his name's Graham Pullen. He's an all rounder, you know, he, he's, he's quite an interesting guy actually. Uh, he's getting on a bit now, Graham, but he, he's a fantastic sea angler. He's fished for all big, you know, tropical species and that. And uh, a bit like Martin Bowler, I guess. And I seen him in this water, I think it was in, in Kent or Essex, and he was trying garden peas. So he bought a a kilo of garden peas and I thought I know they'll catch fish because I mess with them myself but you would hardly be at the top of your list of baits to try so he got a kilo of garden peas it cost him a pound from the supermarket and he was getting runs galore on peas garden peas he was just using two on the rig we know they're quite soft and that you know and he was smashing it up and I thought it was brilliant that because it just emphasized you know, there's, there's a lot of kids out there and people haven't got much money. We never had much money, you know, so we used to try everything. Uh, and that's where your knowledge comes from. You know, you don't have much money, so I think, well, I wonder if that'd work. I'll try it. I mean, kidney beans, they look crap. You know, you think, oh, no, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't fancy that. And I was using, I was, I was baiting up with maple bees and using a kidney bean on the, on the hook with a bolt rig. 
and I caught loads of fish on it. It was brilliant. And obviously the maple peas, another great bait, you know. And uh, so, one... sorry, like with, with the nuts, I mean, I love peanuts, and yeah. what I find I, nearly every time I go fishing, I've got a big pack of peanuts. Yeah, yeah. And when I've gone hours without eating because I've been, you know, doing yeah. whatever. If I have two handfuls of peanuts, you've got your energy back. Yeah, I was getting, you know, I was getting to that point. Where I was weak and fatigued. Yeah. And, you know, two handfuls of peanuts, and I'm going off to go, ready to go. Yeah, they're yeah. full. Of, they're full of all the right things to give you energy, and uh, I think uh, mounted ears and stuff take them. You know, with other things that sort of boost you. For whatever reason, though, carp uh, adore them, and in in the sort of eighties and nineties, they were demonised peanuts. People were saying, oh, you know, they, you can get bad ones that are carcinogenic and this, that and the other. And I think there was a hidden agenda there. Some of these people that were trashing the peanut thing had a vested interest because they had a, a bait company. So they wanted people on boilers and, oh, no, no, don't use the peanuts and stuff like that. So there's an undercurrent of that. So it was easy enough to sort of dismiss them and demonise them. I mean, peanuts used, used it, I mean, Nobody's going to go on a lake where everybody's suddenly using peanuts, so you'd be the only person using them. The only time there was a bit negative was if everyone on the lake was using them, which did happen. And piling them in. Because they were that good. They're piling them in, and the fish become obsessed with them, and they won't pick up boilies. They won't pick up anything else. A bit like maggots, like that. A, a little bit the same like that, yeah. So they became... Uh, and the, Of course, they've not got all the the things that boilers have got in there that are totally good for the fish. You know, they tend to shit them straight out and uh, they're not getting the benefit from the bait, really. They'll give them some energy and stuff and there's some very positive things about peanuts. But on a pro rata, you know, boilers are going to be more... That's why the fish are getting so big now. Uh, designed to, to be yeah, you know, I mean, as good as they can good, be for fish. Exactly that, yeah. So, But if you want to step outside of the box and uh, be different and... Obviously, if you get it right and use these things properly and give them a proper goal, they can be a game changer, total game changer. It's like having maggots in the winter. You know, that you could use the best boil in the world at times and a, a pint of maggots will do it for you. And that's, you know, what I'm trying to get across is to people is, you know, yeah. experiment, play around, you know, because I've, I remember someone said it once, it was like, if you fish the same as everyone else, then you expect the same results as everyone else, you know? Well, yeah, at best, you, you know, you, you're in the same game as everyone else. It's a lottery, really, and then it's the man that's got more time at his disposal that's going to probably do better. You know, he can, he can sort of play the waiting game, and if you've only got a little short window of time with work and family commitments and that, you know, you've got nothing to lose everything to gain from having that super edge. Mm. And quite often, the bait's the key to everything. Doesn't matter so much about rigs or, you know, some of the, the, the less important things compared with, if, they've, if you've got something they really want to eat and they're taking it on all the time, you catch them on very basic rigs. Whereas if you've got something they don't really want to eat that much, you know, you start, because they're obviously getting short of things so regular, your rigs become more important the less decent your bait is. Really, I know I know we should try and strive to have the best rigs on all the time, but you, you can get away with murder when you've got a bait they really want to eat. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You know? So, and there's a lot of those baits out there that are, that are neglected, all but forgotten about. You know, and a lot of the younger viewers and people that are newer to carp fishing, even long timers. I know loads of guys that fish for carp for 30 years and they've never tried peanuts. First time I actually used um, peanuts myself, I, I just put a couple of handfuls in the bay in the morning on this bar, came back half hour later and there's three fish absolutely tearing it up. Yeah. And I went on to start using them over big beds of hemp and, and caught a lot of fish on them. But you know, to this day, I've not used them many times since. No. So, um, that, yeah. The other thing I was just thinking of then in, in my head as we were talking is, um, I was chatting with Jamie Klossick uh, a couple of months ago when we were fishing, and a lot of his, he likes to base a lot of things on sort of stats and, you know, like, so that fish comes out a couple of times a year or whatever, or, you know, it normally comes out in September. And, you know, a lot of his fishing, when he's fishing for big fish, he's got 
these facts in mind. Do you know mm. what I mean? He's focusing a lot of his attention on on previous. Well, results. they say that know, know your know your quarry, don't they? Yeah, you know, I mean, the, the timings and everything. But my point to him was, well, no, I don't like to. I don't like to even take any of that into equation. Don't you? No, when people say that, oh, that only comes out once a year, I don't want to believe. Oh, yeah, I get that. I don't want to believe that. And and I think what what we kind of chatted about was, you know, there's there's ways. I almost like to cheat the system, if you like, by. Yeah. He's like, well, yeah, but you, you fish differently. You know, you'll go and fish one rod in a little margin spot set up where no one else would set up. Um, so you're almost cheating that system. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, and and yeah. you know it's like what we're talking about, giving you trying these different things, trying different baits, you know, out of the box baits or out of the box rigs, um, yeah. can help you cheat that system if you like. Yeah, well, what I've noticed is there's a, there's a lot of people got a tribal mentality about the bait brand that they're with, and I know some people just out of loyalty to if they're with a, a bait company, they won't use anything else but that brand of bait and that. You know, I think that's ridiculous. I mean, I, I'm a, with a bait company and all the rest of it, but I still do what the hell I want. You know, that's just part of my my armory. Of course. You know, it's 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 my, quite often it'd be a go-to thing to do, but by no means I'm a blinkered and think I have to do it. Some people wear the T-shirt, they've got all the logos on and that, you know, and it, Oh, I've got to be on such and such a bait and all that. And uh, it's, it's, I mean, how many times you caught fish on plastic sweet corn and stuff like that, you mm. know? And the other thing I've noticed is um, in the autumns these days, quite often they switch off boilies. You know, there was one particular lake I was fishing, and you could put a handful of boilies in the edge and a handful of tigers. Mm. Come back next day, all the tigers have gone boilies still there. Top up the tigers, come back next day, same I've, again. I've had the same with sweet corn. I've done all that, and uh, you know, the boilies have been the last thing to go. And then it's quite often it's just a simple thing that the water temperatures drop down, and they can't uh, the metabolism's changed, so they can't digest the boiling the same. You know, it's uh, and there's tons of them everywhere because everyone's chucking them all in. <laughs> yeah, well, in. well, carp have got an enzyme that they, in their in their digestive tract called trypsin, and that's a very basic enzyme, and it breaks down stuff like bloodworm and snails and stuff like that, and it's not always the best enzyme for breaking down uh, what we've got in boilies. So as soon as that temperature drops, the, the, the trypsin in their digestive system isn't working as efficiently. Right. So, you know, uh, they, they can't process the bait sometimes. You know, you, you know, you get people that say, oh, you know, we've got winterized baits and winterized fish oils in there and stuff like that. Well, they, they struggle with it. So... You know, you can still catch them on it because they're hungry and sometimes it's like feast of famine, they're going to eat boilies out of necessity. But if you give them a choice, they'll eat stuff that passes through or that they can break down easier, you know. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, what, what I used to do in the winter was uh, just when I was making my own baits is virtually not boil them, you know, 15 seconds. Just the merest skin on so that I could catapult them out. So it weren't just a ball of paste. And then they can digest that easier, you know, than something that, that where the albumins have, have created that rubbery sort of texture. And the tractors are flying out of it. Everything like that, yeah. So that's a little tip for you, you know, and uh, if, if you're not fishing, well, a lot of people use a spawn now, don't they? So you can easily spawn those baits out like that. They've hardly been skinned. Uh, if, you, if you go to the trouble of making your own baits, uh, and that helps with that situation, you know. And... Uh, uh, and it works in the summer as well, I might add. You know, you don't have to just exclusively try it in the winter. It's another good edge to do. Of course. You know, I think that's why a lot of people think that, you know, when you do the, uh, when you, you you basically soak in your baits in lake water to, to weather them. Well, I think it's not just that. I think it's the fact that it makes them dead soft. Because I'm sure carp like soft baits that they can easily, they like hard baits to crunch sometimes, mm. but but they really do like pace and soft baits that they can get straight Chuck back. straight down. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Suppose they, um, less work. Yeah. Well, they're, it's not, like, they're not getting toothache in the fringules, crushing hard stuff. Well, it's same. less energy to digest it as well, isn't it? You know, yeah, it's, of course it's, it's it is, like yeah, us. Yeah. If we were to drink soups and smoothies, your body's hardly having to do any work, is it's it? Exactly to break that, it yeah. down. Well, you, you, you're not releasing all the extra acid from your uh, gallbladder, and the, you know, to when you eat. Like a, if you eat pastry with a lot of fat in it, and you suddenly get heartburn. 
that's where your body's had to release extra acid to break down the fats in the uh, in the pastry. So it's killing you with your heartburn, that's why. But, you know, carp haven't got that availability to do that. So if you put in something that's full of fat, you know, or starches and things, you know, like certain certain ingredients will be very, very difficult to break down with the limited enzymes they've got. And the only alternative they get bunged up or is to just crap it out. So sometimes you think, oh, the bait's working brilliant, they're crapping out everywhere, and it's they're not getting much out of it, and they've struggled with it, you know. So there's, there's all kinds of variants with that. But, uh, you know, basically, it, it's quite complicated, but it's not complicated. If you think that they're going to struggle to digest stuff in the, in the winter, it's obvious they're going to turn to naturals like maggots and stuff like that mm. because it's easier to, to get some goodness out of and work with. Exactly. You know, yeah. So. No. That's, oh, mate. That's, all of that, you know, is really, really interesting. And I'd love to like go out with you somewhere where you know we, we can get a few bites and do some of your comparisons. You know, we have a, we have a list of different things that we can. Well, we can we're try talking about and, that one. Well, we've got some nice things potentially to do. Yeah. Because right? I, I just love to you know inspire people to to try more and and and. F think more for their own, you know, in their own angling, because it, yeah. we know how much more, more rewarding it is when you try something off your own thoughts, your own thinking, and that's out of the box of what everyone else is doing, and you have a massive result, you know? It's, it's what it's all about, isn't it? Of course it is, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, like, I'm, I'm so conscious that there's a lot of people that have got so limited time, you know, like I said, with, with work, families and all that. And I, I would love it that, to, if, if if just a few people take it on board and try some of these alternative baits and uh, this one up there, oh it's not near you <laughs> I reckon you've got something going on up there <laughs> Sorry. I mean we're at bite time so we it can are. easily happen so if we yeah. have to suddenly oh, there is this one over there, yeah, yeah. I, I did put that other rod out didn't oh, I? Right, yeah. cool, alright well we'll wrap that one up there yeah, for okay. now anyway and uh, like I say we've still got two or three hours haven't we so yeah. fingers crossed the lake might have a little gem for us yet. Yeah, <laughs> bloody hope so. Right, our 48 hour session's come to an end, unfortunately, and uh, Sod's low, I've just had a screaming drop back on my uh, left hand rod and uh, definitely a pick up, but I didn't connect with it. It happens now and again, I really don't like drop backs, but uh, yeah, so nothing there on that one. So I'm going to get the other rods in and we're going to pack up now. I very rarely use rig without tipping it with corn as a little visual sighter, even if I'm not putting corn in the mix with the freebies and everything, so it uh, still works. Faster than without it actually. Not always, but most times. So, uh, yeah, that won the battle of the percentages. <laughs> I tend to use the heavy leads a lot as well. Unless it's really bad, the silt, you know. I'll say something else as well, which is an absolute winner. Uh, I used to see people doing it years ago, and I used to cringe when I seen them doing it, but I've done it myself and it's brilliant. If you're fishing somewhere where you think the lead's really plugging in badly, I foam up, so I put foam on the, on the hook. And I get the lead and I unplug it and slide it back a couple of feet. So I've unplugged it from the crap. And uh, as long as you know it's not too choddy out there and that, you can get away with it. Because think of the options. It's either you're fishing down a mouse hole where it's gone right into the sill or at least you've pulled it back a bit. Which would you rather have? I think I'd rather have the one that I've unplugged and slid back a bit. And as I say, if you do the foam right, you can get away with it. So you can get, get the drop, the foam's still on, it's lifted up still unplug it and pull it back and you know you're right. There we go, signing yeah. off with a top yeah. tip from yeah. the master. All right, see you soon guys. Now, one of the regular features we'd like to add on to the show is thinking outside the tackle box. And what is that? Basically, as anglers, we all have lives outside of the sport. And I think it's quite important to have a good balance in life. If you're just fishing all the time and you've got nothing else going on, you're probably going to get to a point where you're going to regret that in life. So for this feature, we are going to look at exactly what anglers like to get up to in their own spare time or outside of fishing. Alan, I know you like a party. 
I do like my party, <laughs> mate. I do. Sadly, my body ain't geared up for doing that week in, week out, though. So it's kind of a... Uh, We're getting on now, aren't we? I'm getting on, mate. 37. Same. I am. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> there's still a few years left in me. No, I do like a party, Joe. I do like a party. I like organising them, planning them, going to them, seeing everyone happy. It's good. I like going to other people's parties and just letting my hair down, you know, without the stress and the burden of, you know what it's like, mate. It is quite a stress organising something like that. Um, like you said, it's, it's very fulfilling to be able to provide um, somewhere where people can have so much fun and you can stand back looking at them people having that yeah. fun and think, well, we've done this. Yeah. You know? I always say, you know, with both lifelong anglers, will be forever, I'm sure, but nothing, you know, catching that target fish or having a big hit, you know, it hits me somewhere, like, it's, it's emotional, but there's nothing that tops standing there, like, in a rave or in a party, and everyone's just vibing, and, like, the deep, you know, it's, that, for me, is the pinnacle of life, like, it's which is weird, really, when, like, I've made my, my career and my living out of fishing and not the music. But it's the positive energy that comes with that, yeah. isn't it? You've got however many people all having an absolutely great time, yeah. um, you know, doing what they like, and enjoying themselves as we naturally should be able to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the vibe that's created in those circumstances. The energy, the atmosphere, the emotions. Yeah, up, yeah, 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 yeah. The yeah, days it's, afterwards. It's special, mate. It's, it is special. So yeah, that's what I do outside of, of my angling. Obviously, music's a massive passion of yours, and I know you've got quite a few friends in the scene these yeah, days. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not. I'm no musician. I'm no DJ. I'm no promoter. I'm no. It's all amateur level with friends and family and. But it's just a passion. It's a passion. It's something that makes me really happy on, on various levels. Um, but like I say, you know, there, there was in years gone by, I was doing it a lot more, a lot more. <laughs> um, I've had to sort of slow that down because, you know, another sort of passion outside of fishing. I've got family now, you know, it takes up a lot of my time, time I want to give, you know, love spending time with them. But other than that, Joe, like, I haven't got really much else. Well, you just your, your work is your passion, mate. It and is, mate. To be honest with you, that's one thing that I'd quite like to kind of touch on is the fact that I think looking from your life outside in, you've cracked the law of attraction without probably even ever studying it. Do you know what I mean? Just yeah. because you knew what you wanted to do, um, you got involved in that, you love your job, and that is what it's all about, isn't it? If you can make work play, then you're going to be a lot... Um, more of a happier person, aren't you? Yeah, you, you are right, mate. You know, I probably do work a lot more than I do anything else. I work more than on my own. I work more than I party. I work more than I fish, you know? And Kev always says to me, well, I know it myself. No one's telling me to do that much work. No one's insisting, you know, I'm not, they're not my set hours. I do it through choice, Joe. I do it for the love of it, the buzz of it. Again, on various levels, there's certain reasons. I get a lot of satisfaction out of a hard day's work. Um, it brings me, you know, going to a rave makes me really happy for various reasons. Going fishing and catching one makes me happy for various reasons. Spending time with my girls and Chloe, mate. Going to work makes me happy, which I know a lot of people will be like, what are you going on about? Like you go to work purely to earn money, but it also brings me a lot of happiness. Um, yeah, there's nothing greater than having a real busy day, getting up the next morning and that feeling inside of like, wow, I had a proper good day's work yesterday. It sets me up for the following day. And, you know, you'd love everyone to be able to have that feeling, wouldn't you? And, and something I'm always trying to push on people is you know, get out of that job. If you really, yeah. it really makes you unhappy, then get out of it. You know, there's always other options, aren't there? Like my father, uh, uh, he'd been a carpenter for 17 years and then in his mid-30s decided to become an English teacher you know and they were they had three kids who were struggling to get by but he done risk it. took a risk massive but, risk yeah. he ended up absolutely loving his job yeah. um, and and you know obviously the, the pupils loved him too you know because he was well well thought of um, but yeah so it's never too late for a change is it mate no nah, definitely not you know and anyone watching this that maybe isn't that happy at the moment I've personally been there with my angling Certainly my carp fishing, there's been times over the years where I weren't happy, I weren't enjoying it, Joe, you know, and sort of, oh, I, don't, I don't want to dress it up as something glamorous, but the buzzword at the moment, or there's a lot of, 
awareness being made with regards to mental health, you know, and people just not happy. You know, they're not happy at home. They're not happy with their work. They're not happy with their angling and it is depressing them, you know, and I'm sure it has depressed people, anglers over the years. Make yourself happy again. <laughs> Make yourself happy. There'll be people out there to support you with that. And I think everyone should be everyone's right to get up in the morning and happy, you know, and, that, and that's one thing I'm blessed with. And I think having balance, which you touched on, if I didn't go partying every two months, two and a half months, if I didn't do that, if I had a whole year without that, I wouldn't be happy. It's therapy, isn't it? Yeah, mate, I wouldn't be happy. <laughs> if I didn't get my fishing fix, I wouldn't be happy. If I didn't get that time at home, you know, away from work and away from fishing, I wouldn't be happy. And it's about having that balance and juggling those balls. I think people that are throwing 99, 100% of their day and their week at work, then probably not going to be that happy. You know, the same for anglers, these full-time anglers that are like, yeah, I'm going full-time and that, and they're seven days a week. Like, most end up not happy. Yeah. Um, nah, so it's I about mean, having that balance. I definitely had a little taste of that this year myself, you know, when I was just fishing four, five nights a week, and I'd get home, and nothing really to do at home, nothing else going on, yeah. you know? Um, and it felt like you had no purpose. And if you've got no purpose, or if your only purpose is to go fishing, then ultimately it's going to affect you in the long run, isn't it? Be happy, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, be happy. Yeah. <laughs>Well, it's the week after last week and we're back for another go. That session turned into a bit of a disaster really with the um, two pike getting bit off when I was fishing at range and got bit off at like 15 yards out, so I lost a load of fluorocarbon. Um, there were these ducks just following me about as well. Like I didn't feed them, I didn't even say hello to them. And yeah, I was over there, they were hanging around in the margins at night and then I moved over here, hanging around in the margins at night, constantly hitting my line and then one of them took off and knocked the rod off the rest. And yeah, I'm guessing that it's uh, probably something to do with the otters. Maybe also it's that time of year when you know, all the other male ducks are trying to have their way with his missus. I keep telling them, get your own bird. But they don't listen, do they? Um, but yeah, so it was a bit of a nightmare session, but I've come back, new head on, new buzz on and um, I baited up before I left that spot where, the, where I had the tent from. I'm feeling quite good. Uh, the weather's not particularly great. It's dropping down to like zeros, minus ones at night, but daytime temperatures, sort of 10 to 11 degrees, super high pressure, not ideal. New moon a couple of days ago, always good. <laughs> so yeah, I think we've got a chance. Um, I've also realised that I've been coming fishing without my lucky crystal a friend, uh, sorry, a present from a friend, came all the way from South America. <laughs> and then uh, the other one is, oops, my lucky lighter. Now I don't know if I even mentioned this last year. Um, I know I've done it as an Instagram story, but basically I was over here one day, I was gonna go to the shop and I, I thought to myself, right, you need a lighter because your lighter's about to die. Went to the shop, come back, I had forgotten to buy a lighter. And I was over there in a bit where you wouldn't expect even anyone to be. And this was facing upwards, like that, with the orange bit. And I saw it and I thought, blimey, if that works, that's a right stroke of luck. That's a mad one. Anyway, picked it up, first time it works. And I looked at it, magic potion. And ever since, it's been very, very lucky for me. So I've not been bringing it. That's probably why I haven't caught anything. So we're probably going to have the Starburst and the Friendly Common this session as a brace. It'd make a nice brace shot, wouldn't it? Well, that is more like it. Oh, I've just sat on that in that swim on long reach for the last two nights on the end of a cold, bitterly cold, northerly wind. Um, and all I've seen really is bream and tench. Apart from yesterday, yesterday I packed up all my gear. Right, they're not here, I'm going down the other end. Loaded up my barrow, um, reeled in the, f the last rod, and then I noticed a fish out the back. Just was just back out swimming along. And then another one behind it and another one. It looked like they were moving up that end. So I, thought, oh, well, I can't move now, can I? 
put the rods back out, had to make that a disturbance, so that obviously wasn't ideal. And then, uh, yeah, nothing happened. Oh, a guy turned up last night in the swim, two doors down, and he had a bite. I thought, that ain't no bream. Went down, gave him a hand, and he had an absolutely stunning stocky, which was like, I don't know, about 13, 14 pound, but big scales on it, and then another row of big scales underneath that. Yeah, really cool carp, lovely winter colours. Um, so yeah, it's well done, Mark, top result that. Uh, and then this morning, another guy I've been chatting to, Steve, he come round, running, <laughs> running into the swim, all buzzed up, and um, yeah, he managed to catch a very, very special one, 43 pound, an absolute unit of a carp. When he put it on the mat, I thought it was the round brown. Um, but it wasn't, it was one of the stockies that's come on. So that's now the biggest stocky, beat the uh, 40 that I had last year. Um, but I imagine there's loads in here now. So yeah, it's quite exciting to see what's going to happen. Um, so yeah, I've moved on to the, the fjords. Fancy the change of scenery, add a little mooch about, and this swim, I didn't actually see anyone fishing it last year, um, or the year before. It's a lovely view. Um, I'm probably not going to show you the view actually because obviously now this is going to start to become a bit more uh, current and I need to keep my wits about me a little bit so yeah rest assured I've got a lovely view and I've got the sun beating down on me this is like another world I feel like I'm on holiday compared to where I was over there in the old uh, arctic blast swim I've got some nice um, maple pork chops from the the supermarket, a couple of other bits and bobs, fresh groceries, so yeah, I'm going to cook myself something to eat and lap up this gorgeous sunshine and uh, yeah, I've already got the rods out, don't need to know what I'm doing, but yeah, <laughs> we'll see what happens tonight. Um, oh, this is so nice, I could easily do a few days just chilling here. <laughs> I probably won't know, I'll get bored within 24 hours and I'll be on my toes again. Tell you what, I am absolutely loving life around here. Um, weather's still very changeable, surprisingly, or unsurprisingly, should I say. After that glorious sunshine, me laying on my bed chair, about an hour later, hail. <laughs> Good old England. Um, yeah, the sky's clearing now and looks set for a nice sunset. And just from around the corner, I should be able to. Uh, catch it and have a nice view of it last couple of nights and there's a couple of nights last week uh, didn't have any view of it at all so yeah it's always a treat when you've got a sunset view there is a geese on the nest a goose even <laughs> there's one goose sitting on a nest but there's another goose with her so yeah there's two geese <laughs> um just around the corner so i was a little bit unsure whether to even fish here to be honest with you um, but she's going back on the nest and I had a little word for her, I was like, look, you know, your biggest threat is otters um, and if I'm here just up the path from you, you know, got much less chance of otters being around. She seemed to agree. Um, so, yeah, we've got a little understanding going on. Talking of otters, found out something a while back, actually. Um, we were on the duck facts last year or other random bird facts, but I forgot about this one. Apparently, a male dog otter will cover like a 20 kilometer area at night and it's got up to four bitches that it visits in that area and in one night it'll visit them all. Busy boy, hey? I can imagine what some of you are thinking. Yeah, sounds like the early days on Tinder. Um, and your, your missus is probably looking at you to check your reaction to see whether you're one of them. <laughs> um, yeah, I was never a fan of Tinder. Never had a date off of there. I had a little, you know, bit of window shopping on there once or twice, but yeah, it's not for me. Hopefully the round brown is going to be in town tonight, but any carp I'll be more than happy with. But yeah, this is prime kind of round brown territory. And I gave it a lot of food last year, so it does owe me an appointment. Fingers are crossed. Come on the sunset. Front row ticket. Front row ticket, front row seat. Same, same, isn't it?
Well, I won't lie to you, I was absolutely loving life on Joey's little island yesterday. It's the right mission to get to, so no one was walking through there and yeah, I could just chill, relax in the sunshine. Although I say that, after giving it the big and about how lovely it was, an hour later, there was a hailstorm. I say a storm, there was a little drop of hail. Um, bit unseasonal, anyway. So yeah, this morning I got up well before first light, sat there watching, listening, did not see or hear a thing and I couldn't be sitting there, you know, camping for no reason. It's the sort of place that if you wanted to go and get away from the world, then yeah, it'd be a lovely bit of, uh, bit of real estate. But when you want to catch fish, you've got to be where the fish are, especially on these big lakes. So I've come back over to Longreach, I had a feeling they might be up here drifting about in the sunshine. The sun's sort of been in and out, but when it is out, it's quite warm. And uh, yeah, so far I've seen about three on the surface and a couple that have stuck their heads out at a range of about 100 yards out, so a bit of activity in the area, which is a lot more than I have had lately, so that's one part of the jigsaw done. Now I've just got to try and catch one. I think I'm suffering a bit, you know, like the carp, you know, sort of throughout the winter months, it gets cold and you know, they tend to um, become easier to catch on certain things in the spring. It's almost like they've forgotten about certain tactics, you know, that get harder throughout the year, like zigs or bridal baits, whatever it is. Anyway, I think I'm suffering a bit like that this year myself. Winter's knocked it back out of me a bit. <laughs> knocked it out of me a bit, should I say. And, uh, yeah, I need to tune back in because I think that's going to be the key. I'll find me fishing mojo again, didn't I? <laughs> tune myself into the universe and catch these big ones. Come on a cup. <sighs> Well, it's been a positively freezing morning on Longreach. Minus two this morning, frost on everything. And I was up well before first light. I had a bream in the night. Not very welcome. And, um, bloody hell. Yeah, I was up at about five o'clock watching the water. And I did see quite a few shows between five and six. They were kind of out of anyone's range, but they were in front of a swim down there. Uh, called Mutley's and I thought right I need to run around there with a bucket really. I thought oh, it's prime time, I can't I can't be reeling in now. And also my bivvy was covered in frost. So I thought well I'll just give it and give it another hour, I'll let that bivvy thaw out a bit and then I'll run round there but <sighs> bad angling that. Someone else obviously saw him and uh, has jumped in there. However, because it's going to be warm today, I think there's a good chance they're going to drift up this end in the sunshine. Um, and I've got one out on a short zig on a bar, one on a single pop-up on a bar, um, and two in the gullies. So got it kind of well covered up here, but I haven't actually seen any carp up here yet. Um, I think it is more of a daytime area. And also, you know, like I said before, it is a daytime lake, so. Hopefully they're going to drift this way, but yeah, kicking myself a bit. I should have just run round there, reeled in and run round there, you know. Um, at least just secure the area, but there you go, someone else has got there first. But yeah, there's a lot of shows out there, um, even though they were kind of out of, well, out of my casting range. Um, the closest you can get to them, the better, you know, obviously. <sighs> Don't know what's happened to the old spring, but this winter needs to do one. I've had enough of it now, these cold mornings. <laughs> Having said that though, it's fresh, it's a lovely clear sky and it's going to be a beautiful day. So yeah, it's a good day for a good day. Let's hope the carp agree. Well, yesterday morning I was absolutely kicking myself for not getting up earlier and moving on to those fish that were showing. Um, I gave it a bit longer in that swim and thought, oh, I just need to get as close as I can really because there wasn't anything showing up there. So I move around into the pipe and uh, finally we've got ourselves a long reach carp. It's not a big carp. Oh, it's one of the stockies, but it's an absolutely stunning little creature. Let's get a bit of water on him. A little bit lively, he's been in the sling for a few hours. Glorious morning, and thankfully, it sounds like that was the last frost 
Come on, mate, calm yourself down. Let's have a little look at you. All right, this is your best side. They're both pretty cool, actually. There we go. Only a small one, but it's super cool and super welcome after the struggle I've had lately. Look at that. Some really, truly cracking stockfish they've put in here in the last few years. And they're, uh, yeah, gonna do well in the future, that's for sure. Mega, really chuffed for that. All right, back you go, little one. Oops. Nice to meet you. Go and tell the friendly common I'm looking for him. <laughs> Backwind. I was fishing the quarry in Essex. Uh, float fishing that particular day. I had them going really well off the top between 15 and bomb hole. I think I caught a couple that day and there was one particular big fish kept going up and down the sort of centre of the channel. And I remember thinking, that looks really big. And a lot, sometimes my tactics for floater fishing can be get, just getting a, a hook bait in front of a patrolling fish. I particularly did really well on tulpits doing that. It wasn't even really about getting them feeding, it was just literally winding that hook bait so as they're cruising up and down, it comes up in front of them and bang, they have it. Well, that day, I managed to do that with this particular fish and I never forget the, this pair of lips and shoulders coming up, taking it and it, it just stripped 30 yards of line off me straight away, dived straight into a weed bed and I was like oh and I probably should have been a little bit more patient with it. I gave it too much pressure and the line parted. In hindsight I should have just been more patient maybe gone and got my life jacket out of the car, got out in the boat and got over the top of it because I knew that it was this big fish. Um, at the time, there was a couple of 40 pounders in there, Cassius and Shoulders. And to this day, I'm sure it was one of them. All right, carp and calamity is right. I'm the first one, it was uh, back down in days in Meads. Now, we was all quite a few of us fishing down there, so it was quite a busy weekend. And um, the fisheries officer, or manager at the time, of Lee Valley Parks came down to the session, him and his, him and his wife. So like you do, you, I suppose you expect, because fishery managers, they, that's, that's their job, you expect them to do something a bit special when they turn up and fish. Anyway, he's set up, he's bivvies up, Suddenly, about an hour later, he's up, he's, he's rods doubled over. And obviously everyone's like, oh God, he's got one already. And Because it wasn't an easy light, light, like, you know, maybe it's like, yeah, but yeah, he's got one. And he's like giving it this, about 10 minutes later, and we've all looked over, <laughs> and he's pulled in a barrel. <laughs> He didn't have a fish at so all. It was a barrel. My God, did we take the mickey out of him after that. I suppose the second one is what I'm quite famous for. Um, I've got a swim named after me over at Nasen Meads called the Burnt Hat. It was back in the days we used to use candles at night. So I've got a candle on me bucket. It's got to about seven o'clock. Later on in the year, obviously it's got dark by then. And my mate's wife has come over with a load of Chinese and he, he, he's on a point a bit further up. Bearing in mind it's dark and... and, and I said, I'll tell you what, I'll take you round there. It's only round the corner. No problem, so I've gone round there. Having a chat with them all. Well, we've heard a... And we all looked round and my mate said, your swim's glowing. I said, what do you mean? And, uh, glowing weren't a bloody word. It was like a tower inferno. I said, me swim's on fire. Oh, I've gone running around there. Well, it's gone. The old shebang is gone, the old lot. The only thing left, right, 
was a wallet I had put under my bed chair and luckily I, I had about 100 quid in there, 50 pound notes and they were just about singed on the outside. So luckily I, I managed to escape with 100 quid. Burnt butts on my rod and my landing net was burnt and melted. But I still fished that night. So it didn't bother me. I know it was bad, but that, that was the last time I used candles, that's for sure. Thank you.